So good morning, back in the saddle again. So I actually broke back into school so I could get a whiteboard and so I could feel like I was actually someplace where I was supposed to be doing the work I'm supposed to be doing. So what I'd like to do in this video um, is sort of situate uh, the things they carried as a postmodern tact. So um, some of it'll be a little review, some of it'll be some quick notes. Um, if you have your comp book, what comp book? Yeah, go dig it, go hit pause on the record, hit pause on the laptop, go find it, shuffle to the car, look under the bed, pull it out of the burning barrel, but save the comp book. You go back to the comp book, right? You go back to, we had a lecture a while back about, um, about the rise from Plato to modernism. I would read the cave, medieval, enlightenment, renaissance time period. And then we got to um, modernism and Nietzsche, God is dead, remember that. So we talked about that thing. Postmodernism is the next phase. You can see on the board behind me, oh, I love a good whiteboard. Better if it was a chalkboard. Ah. Um, so yeah, we start with Plato, allegory of the cave, right? Knowledge is located, there is absolute truth. It is located in the world of ideals. Medieval Europe, the rise of Christianity, the rise of the church, the rise of Catholicism and the kings, right? The rise of nation states. So kings and popes, locus of all power, all authority, right? And again, still divine, the divine right of kings carries over into the Renaissance and then finally into the Enlightenment where thanks to people like Descartes and Immanuel Kant, um, thinkers begin starting to put the death knell in the power of the king and the power of God to be the be-all, end-all, but it creates a kind of crisis. A crisis that takes a long time to unravel, but it gets us to modernism. Modernism, you may remember, begins, I situated in 1885, is when modernism kicks off, right? And we've got Nietzsche's death of God, recognition that if we're going to put all our hope and power and, <clears throat> you know, everything into... Um, either God or institutions, the institution of reason, the institution of king, the institution of the church, that what we're going to wind up with is going to be shallow and empty and is going to come to just a screeching halt, right? And so Nietzsche is this prophet crying out in the darkness. Um, as a result of Nietzsche's cry in the darkness, right, what happens is there becomes, in essence, a power vacuum. Who, what, how, how do we have authority? How do we have knowledge? How do we know things, right? And so in to fill that void over the course of the 1890s, early 1900s is actually going to be the rise, for some people, it's the rise of the artist. So instead, you're going to get people arguing that art is actually going to save our souls. Art is going to provide the way out. Art is going to be the access to that deeper truth, right? So they come back from World War I. They come back from, you know, the um, Spanish-American War things. People come back, and, and they're looking around for something to give them meaning. And for a lot of people, it's, it's that, art. Um, this, of course, results in a kind of uh, fragmentation or discontinuity. Uh, the sciences experience you know, the same thing. Denial for Einstein, these people saying the way the foundations that you originally thought were there, the traditions you originally thought were there, are no longer there. Done. Over with. Right? But they do have something to offer in its place. Here's a new version of the atom. Here's a new version of how the space and time work. Um, you get the same thing in, in math, in history, and in really all, all throughout all sort of what we call areas of knowledge. Ooh, T-O-K. Um, so you have this shift that takes place in modernism, and it seems to provide a kind of way, a kind of solace, a kind of, of filling in the void, right? Up until, drum roll please, World War II. World War II um, is the, is, becomes the breaking point for, um, for all these, these ways and means of knowing and being. World War II, with things coming out of World War II, you know, post-World War II, when we discover what the Nazis were actually up to, um, right, what we are later going to refer to as the Holocaust, we are going to drop not one, but two atomic bombs, 
right? The devastation, the horror, the kind of uh, just the, the, the fallout from that are going to, you know, if there was any kind of hope for some kind of locus of power to save us, um, people are going to think, politicians, scientists, all kinds of people are going to think no more. After those, you know, after those kind of events, that kind of horrors is not going to happen. So what does happen? And that's where we want to pick up today. So I want to try to give a quick overview of just what exactly is postmodernism, um, you know, just what, what does it entail, and then start to make connections to the readings that you've done. We'll start first with Tim O'Brien and things they carried. We'll try to connect to that in this little video clip. Uh, in the next little video clip, we'll talk a little bit about John Cage uh, and the Kyle Gann reading, four minutes and 33 seconds of first listening. And so we'll kind of work our way through that. So whiteboard, classroom, I feel better. Let's see what happens. To um, those of you that showed up on the video chat uh, yesterday on Wednesday, April 1st, I really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Uh, for those of you that filled out the Google form, um, I've enjoyed reading that as well. Uh, it's been amazing to see some of the responses I, I well, I, I really enjoyed it, and I am, you know, based on what I've read, I would say that you are, as a whole, seem to be handling this uh, new scenario pretty well. So I'm really pleased about about that kind of thing, um, that, that, that what what you're doing. And again, I take no credit for this. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the vehicle for this. Uh, several of you have commented and apparently have been keeping up with um, some mindfulness sittings and you have said that you found those really helpful. I'm so pleased that, that again, that is your doing, that is your work. Um, so I, you know, I applaud your efforts in that area and encourage you to keep it up. Um, so, all right, postmodernism, what is it? So, um, so. Obviously, the word itself, the bare minimal meaning of the word is just after modernism, right? Post modernism, after modernism. But it, it's not just an extension, and it's more, you know, it's 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 moving knowledge and thinking into, into other areas, other directions. So we'll talk about it. Most people are going to situate postmodernism as happening between 1945 and the 1990s. Um, kind of post, you know, 1990s, early 2000s, early 21st century, um, people don't really know what to call the time that we're in. Um, post postmodernism, neo postmodernism, uh, just, you know, I don't, I don't, don't know how that's shaping up. I've kind of left that behind, but I can at least get us here because this is the time period in which Tim O'Brien is going to be relevant. So a um, couple of things are interesting about postmodernism. One of the things, one of the key hallmarks of postmodernism for thinkers is the shift in the cultural landscape. Postmodernism takes into account larger forces, larger, um, there's an awareness of the connection between a lot of what we do with our lives and how we think about things, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, coming out of World War II, for America at least, the 1950s, right, was prosperous, which led to things like, um, well, led to rise of consumer culture, right, the expansion of things like department stores, shopping malls, five and dimes, uh, the rise of movie theaters. One of the great gifts of World War II, unexpected silver lining, is going to be the proliferation of cinema for those film kids, right? Um, more people are going to the movies in the 40s than really any time in history since. No, we've never matched those numbers. Um, and people are going to this brief window in the 50s before television really gets up and running when cinema is going to just proliferate. So there's all kinds of um, things for us to consume, stores, purchasing, material goods, right? There's this huge expansion there. And for thinkers, philosophers, literary theorists, cultural theorists, that is, that, that is a real shift in the way because more people have it. More people have access to that. 
right? When we come back, it's not just an economic boom for the people at the top, it's an economic boom for all kinds of people. And so there is this, this proliferation of, of consumption. The other thing that a proliferation of consumption um, brings about is the rise, the rise of leisure time. Right. The workforce is becoming more and more urban um, and it's becoming more and more in a sense managerial. It's not, you know, we went from the farms into the big city and now we work in a mill in the big city for 12 hours a day, six days a week. That is, that's falling off, right? Instead, with the rise of department stores and the rise of banking and the rise of all kinds of other kinds of what we might call service industries, um, there's a need for workers. And these workers come in and this is where you're gonna to start to get the nine to five kind of class. People who are going to work and then have time after work. The other group of people that's gonna have time and really is gonna shape postmodernism are actually going to be teenagers. Um, some people point to this time period as the invention of the rise of the teenager. Right? With the rolling out of suburbs, the rise of suburb, suburban America, is the rolling out of public schools, public education in mass, which means that we need places for kids to go, right? So we gotta house them from the bulk of the day. And then when that day is, when their day is done, what are they gonna do, right? And because their parents are rich and have money or are richer than they were back in the 30s, 20s or 30s, they have access to cars, they have access to, you know, um, spending cash. And so, so do shops going to the movies, starting to buy records, the rise of popular culture is huge. That's the other gift that uh, World War II gives to American culture is a real explosion in technology and the recording industry. So that it becomes easy to make records, easy to make film, right? I mean, because cameras have changed and, and tape recorders have become smaller and lighter. And so they can go a lot more places and you get this expansion of this kind of, um, well, this, this kind of, I don't know if you can call it lowbrow art, whatever, but you know, the rise of jazz, the rise of certain kinds of easy listening music. And yes, of course, we get into the 50s, we're gonna have the rise of rock and roll. So things for teenagers to do. Teenagers with leisure time and money to spend. So it becomes this kind of real youth oriented um, culture or time period of 50s and 60s. And of course, you know, those of you that stayed awake in history class know that when we get into the 60s, right, the youth play a real significant role in starting to seize political power. The other thing though that happens there um, in a kind of real subtextual kind of way that becomes interesting is going to be because of all three of these things. I'm just gonna label it for right now as the rise of identity. And that is to say, young people begin to experiment, begin to realize, as do their parents to a lesser extent, that they can take on a different identity. Who they were when they were born does not have to be the person they remain the rest of their lives. This is where that idea starts to really come into full fruition. You know, my grandparents born in 1918, 1919 into farmers, they never really saw themselves as being able to do anything but farm work. There was no thought that my grandparents were going to leave Fosterburg, Illinois, right? And my grandmother, my grandparents never did. They never lived anywhere else. Um, you know, and for them, that was, that was just kind of how they thought about things. But I've talked, you know, in talking to them uh, when they were still alive, you know, they had hopes for their children. They had hopes for my mom, my uncle, my aunt, that they would go on, go do something you know, better, do something different, actually get out of town. Um, then I actually am a product of that. My mom and my dad wanted to get out of Fosterburg. And so we did, right? And so, you know, it's just kind of, in a certain way, the trajectory of my autobiography is kind of meshes up real stereotypically, real nicely with this kind of move, this kind of shape, this kind of ability for my parents to try to re redefine themselves. But that, you know, there's that at a large scale, but it also takes place at, you know, it becomes um, a lot more available to teenagers where they are. 
This is where you can get the rise of jocks and the rise of nerds and the rise of the cool kids at school, right? You got maybe some time on your hands, start digging around the YouTubes, right? Look for a show called Happy Days. You ever seen Happy Days? Dig back, way back, right? It's a, it's a sitcom set in the, it's, it was made in the eight, 70s, but it's set in the 50s and it's precisely about, in many ways, this kind of identity culture that's going on in the conflicts humorously portrayed, of course, that it creates, right? And, but it brings together cool kids and the nerds and the jocks and the cheerleaders and the right. So those kind of identities get born in this time period because identity becomes malleable. It's not defined. It's not, you know, etched in, in your birthplace, which brings us to the first chapter of the things they carry. For Tim O'Brien, one of the things that he begins to explore in this novel, which I'm going to argue is very much a postmodernist novel, all right? And one of the things, ways he does it in that very first chapter, the things they carried, is he tries to wrestle out what makes up an identity. How do you know who somebody is? And for O'Brien and the characters in the book, right, a lot of the, their identity is what they carry. Right? There's the stuff they're issued by the army. You got to have a backpack. You got to have a weapon. You got to have ammo. Right? But even the army begins picking out people and assigning them identities. You're going to be the machine gunner. You're going to be the radio guy. Right? And so there's that. And then there's the personal markers. And you notice the personal markers are different for every character. Right? The Bible, the leather bound Bible that he carries. Right? The, uh, the hatchet that Kiowa carries. Right, the pantyhose that I think is like I remember Lavender carries, right, of his girlfriend. The different things, the pebble that the lieutenant carries. So it's all the different things that they carry that, and they go to, you notice the other thing they do is the characters keep going to those things themselves to remind them of who they are, right? It's identity formation, identity creation. And we keep doing it. And the question I asked you to do with the backpack assignment, yeah, I'm looking at you. You should have done it, right? Don't be late. Um, the thing I was asking you to do with the backpack experience is to explore, right? And maybe what I'll do is I'll try to make all that information available and you can compare and contrast with your classmates and see who you can identify. Everybody's got notebooks and pens and pencils and books in their backpack, right? That's that's not the surprise, right? What you want to look for and see, like, what are the surprising things? What are the things that signal who you are, right? The, you know, the, the uh, course syllabi from classes from last year, even, that people like, say, Morales and Deschamps probably still have buried in the bottom of their backpack, right? Cole Anderson's probably got something from 10th grade in his backpack, right? But whatever, it's, you know, but that's part of the identity of who they are smart, disorganized kid, um, or the incredibly organized kids, right? Kids, the people in their backpacks that pulled out and they had little cases, little pouches for every single thing. And these are my orange sharp tip Sharpies, and these are my orange black sharp tip Sharpies, and these are my 0 0.3 lead pencils, and these are my 0.5 lead pencils, right? And it's all, all organized. Folder for this, folder for that, et cetera, et cetera. That too is part of identity. Right, we tell ourselves it's how we work, and it's just kind of like whatever. But in doing that, right, and in, in, in acting that, we're enacting a kind of identity. So, right, the novel is going to explore that. If you've read further in the novel, you have finally figured out, and I think it happens on page 36, that one of the main characters, and especially in some of the first person sections, did you notice how some of the chapters are first person and some are not first person, some are third person? Right? Again, we'll talk about that, another hallmark of postmodernism. But in the first person chapters, the guy doing the narrating is a guy by the name of Tim O'Brien, who grew up in Minnesota, who was on track to go to journalism school, who got drafted and went to Vietnam. And then, of course, you looked on the front cover of the book, and it's written by a guy named Tim O'Brien, who was born in Minnesota and who was on track to go to Harvard to study writing and who got drafted, right? But the, Tim O'Brien, the character, and Tim O'Brien, the author, you know, the easy move is to just conflate them and say they're one and the same, and this is some sort of weird, whacked-out memoir, 
But I mean, how fair is that? If you've read far enough, you've heard Ralph, Tim O'Brien, the character, make reference to his daughter. Tim O'Brien, the author, has two boys. Um, right? So there are similarities, but there are differences. And he's very much in control of that. He's very much working that. He's very much making use of that kind of an awareness. He has an awareness of that kind of duplicity. So, you know, in another way, he's asking questions about identity. He's challenging us to think about identity. So, again, hallmark of postmodernism. Um, so, I'm going to, I think, stop now. Okay, I'm back. Um, I may post this all as one. I don't know how long this is going to this. I don't, I don't know how long I've been talking so far. I may post this all as one thing. Um, I may break it up. We'll just see. It's a brave new world. I'm trying to be flexible, learn my way through. So, um, but I, just my own personal experience, I'm good for maybe about 10 minutes of watching somebody on screen talk to me before I totally whack out losing my mind and I don't want to like set that up. So I'm going to try to keep them short. But a couple of quick things to try to else to roll out. So postmodernism um, challenges us to sort of like allows us to sort of challenge ourselves with regard to identity, right? So identity is one issue with regard to postmodernism that connects us to the things they carried. The other place that postmodernism begins to challenge us um, is with this idea of a text. What is a text? Stanley Fish, is there a text in this class, right? How to identify a poem when you see one is an essay about text making. And really largely what I've tried to do this year is really get you to bring, to ask that question. What is the text? How do I know it? And what happens? Postmodernism is gonna make the move. Um, and again, if you've paid attention to years and dates, you know that 1960s, Philip Gove, you remember him, editor of Webster's Third International Unabridged Dictionary, the descriptivist dictionary, right? The shot that, that, that set off the dictionary wars. Um, happens in the 60s, happens during the time of postmodernism, because for linguists and for scholars and hardcore academics, right, language, the recognition of language is malleable, language as a place of contest, definitions as up in the air was, was unfolding. And so they were responding to that. Um, and so there was, you know, this idea of what a text is, is a place that's open for challenge. Um, and then one of the ways that that, well, one of the ways that that takes place is the recognition, and if you follow Stanley Fish's argument, is that texts are social constructions. We create them, we define them, we decide what poems are, right? And that may change over time, and that might even change from classroom to classroom, but at some level, if we're gonna talk about poetry or we're gonna talk about art or we're gonna talk about science, we're gonna talk about what the institution has decided is that thing. And that's the second fish piece. What makes an interpretation acceptable? The really short answer, if you read it, and you should have read it looking at you, Stephens, is that institutions make interpretations acceptable. Whatever the institution will bear then creates the thing. So it's only a poem if the institution says it's a poem. You can do whatever you want in the privacy of your bedroom, whatever, right? Make it and call it art or poetry or whatever it is. You can flip your mattress and say that was a poem. Great, no problem. But nobody's taking you seriously once you walk outside that door and you say this is a poem. Until the institution backs you, right? The academic institution, the religious institution, the governmental institution, whatever it is, until you have that kind of power, that kind of stamp of okayness, it's not going to be that thing. That's a hallmark of postmodernism. Up until postmodernism, somewhere, somehow, somebody was going to argue that things are a certain way, right? Things change after 45. And so, but we do need some kind of power. We recognize that and life goes better if we all agree that the red octagon shape with the letters S-T-O-P on it means stop and we all agree what that means, but there's no stop sign in nature, right? I don't know how many long walks you've taken around your house in the last three weeks, but the only stop signs you've seen have been man-made and placed there by institutions, right? Societal ones. 
So, and we give them meaning and life goes a lot better when we all agree to obey them. So institutions create meaning. Institutions actually create text. And then we can interpret the text and then we say it's the text. So interpretation always comes first, then the thing exists. This is for postmodernists then, they boil that down to questions of text. And what is a text? How to recognize a text? How do you know it's a text? And again, <clears throat> O'Brien bears this out. He's a great postmodern example um, in his okay, uh, the things they carry, right? So I asked you to fill out that Google form. Yeah, still looking at you back there in the back row. Um, Smith, uh-huh, yeah. Emmons, uh-huh, yeah. So, right, I asked you to look and some of you pointed out that on the back cover it says fiction and some of you pointed out that on the copyright page Right, or even the uh, title of the title page is listed as a work of fiction. And then the copyright page, it's called a work of fiction. Kudos, not a problem, got it, right? But then there's the whole Tim O'Brien thing. If Tim O'Brien the character and Tim O'Brien the author are to have some kind of relationship that extends beyond fictional, right? If in somehow way, shape or form, we are to say that they are the same entities, then we seem to be you know, fudging the line about what is actually a fiction. And then it gets weirder if you ask me when he dedicates the book to his characters. I mean, again, we can wrap our heads around some interpretive exercise and say, well, that's because the characters each represent somebody that he knew. And so he was just like trying to code it like that because he didn't want those people to know or they didn't want to be told. But again, if you're doing that, Right? If all you've done is change the names, do you really have a work of fiction? Isn't that a work of nonfiction? The names have been changed to protect the innocent, but the story is still true. If you change the names and you change the story, then you don't really have a work of memoir or work of truth. You have a work of fiction. Right? So O'Brien is trying to very much, and I think would argue very consciously, he knows the game. It's not his first novel. He's published two works at this point, one of which is a memoir going after Kachia. Oh, no, If I Die in a Combat Zone, right? Which was a work of memoir. His first novel is a novel called Going After Cacciato, both about guys in Vietnam. Obviously, the second one being very much based on his life, um, right? So he knows, he understands the difference. He's written one of each. Here, he's blurring the boundary. If you hear him speak, uh, which I did years ago, Lenore Ryan actually um, did a, like a countywide read, big read kind of thing. And they read the things they carried, Lenore Ryan College did. And then they brought Tim O'Brien in to speak. And I went to it. Uh, he's really interesting. And one of the things he talked about is emotional truth. And that emotional truth doesn't have to measure up to real truth. That is to say, on April 2nd, Mr. Whiteside broke into school and recorded this video in his old classroom, right? Which is an event that happened. Here we are, right? But he makes the argument that emotional truth is trying to convey to you and I what it felt like to be in that situation. And his argument is in order to do that, sometimes what you need to do is you need to lie because the lie will cause you to have that experience, right? More so than just telling you about the experience in a certain way. So he argues for a kind of emotional truth that can be born out of lies. Um, that's kind of pretty postmodern actually. So you say, here's something that's not true, but the experience you have once you've read it is a true experience. And he thinks it kind of correlates to the experience that you you know, was going on at that moment. Um, if you want a small, teeny, weeny, micro moment of this, think back in your memory to watching Apocalypse Now. Do you remember the scene where the chef goes into the jungle looking for mangoes with, um, with Willard, right? And they're hunting mangoes in the bushes and then everything goes quiet and then the tiger jumps out. When I show that movie in classes now, what I always do during that scene is I stop looking at the screen and I start looking at the students. And every class, without fail, 90, 90 to 95% of you, when the tiger jumps out of the bush, you physically recoil. 
It's, it's physical. You move back, you gasp, you, you exclaim. And it's, you know, this is what sin of the power of cinema is to bring you a lie that creates a moment of startle. It only lasts a split second. You know it's a movie. Obviously, there's not a tiger in the room, but you've had that experience and you felt just a nanosecond of fear. That's the power of cinema. And that's one of the things that makes cinema so attractive for us is we go and we get to have emotional experiences, right? That are born out of lies, that are born out of, you know, and even when we're watching documentaries and we are seeing things that are real in another very truthful way, they're not real at all. Somebody had to make a decision about how to frame this image, where to put the computer on the table to get the board behind him over his head so he can see and talk to you, right? So that is another instance of um, O'Brien or another example, that's an example of the power of a text. Texts don't have to be born out of truth. They don't have to be born out of a kind of what we might call a reality. Instead, texts are things that we make. They carry meanings with them that are in a sense social. We agree to have this meaning or to apply this meaning. We agree that this is a work of fiction, but we also agree when we read it that it's a really problematic work, right? Or at least the idea of fiction in this work is problematic. If you've looked ahead, there's a chapter called How to Tell a True War Story. If you've read the first 88 pages, which you should have done, again, looking at you back there in the back row, talking about people like, you know, the boys in the back corner, Fisher, or uh, who would be back there? Hollage would be back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't need buddy. Um, right? If you've read those pages, you know that, he's, that there's a narrator character that talks to us about storytelling, about story making, right? And in a way, he's asking us to talk about the stories that we tell ourselves that make up our lives, life as story. Um, so there's a lot happening in this book, I think, that dovetails nicely with postmodernism. Um, that also is probably about 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop here and uh, give us all a break.